Shalom everyone. Welcome to another edition of Hermes Academy Moment. It's me, Stacy, and I have with me one of my favorite people in the entire world, Coach in the Fight. Hey y'all. Today I want to explore through the scriptures what the scripture has to say about righteous thoughts. It seems to me that whenever I am tempted or whenever someone is tempted by something or someone, um, that temptation seems to appear first by way of our thoughts. And I want to explore that, how we can have righteous thoughts, which is thoughts that line up with the instructions of the Father by way of the Shepherd of Hermas. Okay. I was thinking about reading chapter 1. But I think we're just going to do an overview of it because we're hoping that everyone has their copy of the Shepherd of Hermas. And if not, they can go over and find a copy or PDF of the Shepherd of Hermas on the web. Yeah, it's one at um, en.wikisource.org is one place that we can find a PDF of the William Wake translation of the Shepherd of Hermas. But if you want, we can also include chapter one in the comment section or the description of this video so people can read along. Okay, so let's do that. Have a copy so people can read along. As I was talking about how temptation seems to come to us first by way of thoughts, I want to give a short testimony about myself of how I've always seemed to have a stronghold against me by way of thoughts. It just seems like whatever I'm doing, even if I'm just, you know, out working from working in the garden or just doing things with the family, seems like Satan always seems to um, come to me by way of what I now know unrighteous thoughts. And they don't have to be anything lewd or things like that, but just everyday flyby thoughts seems to come my way. And I started off trying to get help with those thoughts by just reading different books, you know, books that, such as The Power of Positive Thinking, Think and Grow Rich, not necessarily dealing with the rich part, but just trying to get help with my thoughts. But I didn't try scripture. I tried all, the, all of the self-help books. And they did seem to work but it was only temporary. Within the week or sometimes month, my thoughts were always back into thinking things that I believe now were not pleasing to the Father. So when I began reading um, The Shepherd of Hermas and started with this chapter one, it just really hit a chord with me that I can get a hold, I can become a master of my thoughts, and I'm hoping that this will help those who are having problems with their thoughts, because as I said, that when we are tempted, it usually first appears by way of our thoughts. What do you think about that, Coach? Well, the thoughts are important. I'm sitting here scrolling down through some of the um, verses that talk about thoughts, and the King James Version of the Bible, and, you know, it's one of the most important things about, you know, who we are is, you know, the way we think our thoughts. So to be in control of those thoughts actually goes a long way, um, and the opposite is true, too. Yeah, the Third Testament tells us, uh, which was very um, awakening to me, is that our thoughts are deeds. Yeah. And that it also tells us that our mind is creative. And if we let our mind have way to do whatever it wants to do, then what our mind is going to do is lead us into dark places. And that happens by way of our thoughts. So let's get into the book of the Shepherd of Hermas. We're going to start off with chapter one, talking about Hermas and um, the lady. Okay. And... In chapter 1, it tells us that Hermas uh, meets upon this lady whom he had uh, previous involvement with 
by way of being associated with her as far as they were servants or slaves to a owner uh, together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Hermes um, finds her washing in the river and he walks over and lends his hand to help her help her out of the river. And upon this, she was unclothed and Hermes began to have a desire for her. Yeah, yeah. Says he thinks, how happy should I be if I had such a wife, both for beauty and manners. Upon thinking this, Hermes continues to think about her. You know, as he was walking to um, a village, he was continuing to have these thoughts about her. And soon afterwards, he falls asleep and he has a vision where the lady comes to him and she accuses him to the father for his evil desires, his yeah. evil thoughts. Hermes then tells her that I have never had an evil thought about you. And from there, she lets him know that even though he's a righteous man, he can have unrighteous thoughts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that a little. Uh, I was going in the direction, Coach, of that Hermes was having lustful thoughts for her. Yeah. And that these lustful thoughts is what got him in trouble. But you said, no, that's not what it was that he was having, it's not no, necessarily the lustful thoughts that were, um, not lustful thoughts, it's not necessarily the desire for her that got him into trouble, it's the covetousness. Well, what I said was, is that when Hermes first saw this lady in the River Tigris and she was washing, before that moment, he had only thought about her as a sister. But when he saw her naked and he recognized her beauty, that he started to contemplate the idea of having her as a wife. Now, we know already that Hermes was already married. So here he is looking at this woman and now he's lusted after her. I use the analogy of a pretty car and how when a pretty car rides by, most men and some women would actually turn and will look at that car. And there's no problem in that. The problem is when we start to contemplate the idea of owning that car or getting that car and start coveting after that car. Well, just like that car is just like with a woman. If we don't squash that idea of taking ownership of that car, we're actually going to do something that is going to get us in trouble. You know, maybe we're going to go take a loan out or maybe we're going to go try to find other means of getting that car. But it's the idea of actually having her as a wife that got him in trouble. Not saying that she was a beautiful woman, but when he started saying how happy would I be to have her as a wife is what actually got him in trouble. So when a man sees a very pretty woman walk across the aisle from him and he turns his head and looks at her you're saying that that is not necessarily a sin no um no and you know the thing is you know a lot of men get accused behind that when they're walking through the mall or through the walmart or whatever and the pretty lady walks by and the man heads turn um, that's a natural thing for our heads to turn no different than it does when that pretty car rides by. The thing that we really need to understand is that just because the head turns doesn't mean that the man is desiring that woman. Just because he looks at her and recognizes her beauty doesn't mean that he wants to make her a wife at all. If he did, that would put him in the same position that Hermes is in right now. And that's going to get accused before the father of lusting after her. So that initial look is not a transgression. It's not a transgression against the instruction of the, of the father. 
what gets Hermes and what get a lot of people in trouble is when they start meditating and continually thinking about her because that's what Hermes did. He continued to think about her. He continued to uh, desire her and that is what leads to getting a lot of um, divorces, uh, getting that loan out on a vehicle that you can't afford, uh, buying that house and then saying, what did I do this for? And things like that. It's still those, um, it's not that initial desire. It's that afterwards thoughts, the yeah. afterthoughts. Yeah. You gotta, gotta squash that thought when it first tries to take you over. If you don't, it's going to grow and it's going to fester until you actually eventually going to take action. So we can say that probably a lot of divorces, if not a lot of um, misplaced homes have happened just because of that man or even that woman getting accused of looking at that person. That is eventually going to lead to problems because the same is true too. When the woman is having thoughts of her husband doing these things and she's continued to let those thoughts fester in her mind she's she's actually going to create yeah. problems yeah. that's going to damage the marriage yeah because like we said the third testament says that thoughts are deeds and if i continually to think continue to think on he wants her he has a desire for her and then those thoughts are going to materialize mm -hmm. and it's going to uh bring a bad result upon the marriage mm -hmm. Um, I got out here, learning to get a handle on our thoughts can be very difficult, but we see that in the scriptures, the Father requires us to, because if we have unrighteous thoughts, the end result of them will cause us to do things that will transgress the instructions and the laws of the Father. Let's take a look at some of the scriptures that you have that's talking about thoughts. Now, the first one is over here in the Third Testament of the Bible in chapter 35. It's called the power of thoughts, feelings, and the will. It goes into detail about our thoughts and how they're actually deeds. We're out of the section called sending and receiving thoughts and its effects, we hear about how our thoughts affect people. I think we did a class or we discussed this in a class not too many years ago, how when we are sitting there minding our business and all of a sudden we have evil thoughts about certain people that have done certain things to creep into our mind, it could very well be that that other person is transmitting those thoughts to us. In other words, they're having thoughts about us and we are somehow feeling them thinking about us and we start to think about them yeah. as well. And even though we may be hundreds or thousands of miles apart, we're actually having an argument with that person by way of telepathy. Yeah, we, and we, like he said, we learned this about this in the Third Testament of the Bible. Another thing the Third Testament of the Bible tells us about thoughts is that how we are influenced by incarnated and discarnated spirits that are around us and how they influence the things that we think about. Well, let me read right here in verse 4. It says, every incarnated and discarnated spirit emanates vibrations when it thinks. Every emotion exerts an influence. You can be sure that the world is filled with these vibrations. So this tells us that those who are alive and even those who are asleep are creating negative vibrations within the world and are actually causing problems around us. Yeah, it also goes on to say that when we are, and talking about the ones who are alive, when we are around people who let off healthy vibrations, healthy influences, that we think about good things. 
But when we are around people who let off um, harmful vibrations, harmful influences, then we tend to think about things that are not pleasing to the Father. That's true. Let me read verses 8 and 9. It says, When from your mind emerges an idea or a thought of light, in that manner it reaches its objective to fulfill its beneficial mission. If instead of kind thoughts, impure emanations surge from your mind, they will only cause harm wherever you send them. I say to you that thoughts are deeds, and as such, they remain written in the book which exists in your conscience. What this is telling us is that we have to and we will be held accountable for our thoughts. Yeah, mm-hmm, yeah. Um, for me, a lot of times when I have uh, thoughts that are unrighteous, I have subject myself to um, different people or media or um, you allow those thoughts. I allow, to yeah, because I'll just take for instance um, yesterday, I was sitting there browsing the internet and I ran up on a uh, sitcom show that uh, comes on television and a still small voice said don't look at that don't even go there but of course I did and immediately the show which had appeared last year as a very decent show now you have the lady who is being very disrespectful to her husband telling him to shut up da 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 this da 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 that and I'm like what the heck but now I have those thoughts in my head. And I'm always telling uh, my kids or, you know, myself, don't look at that because I don't want those thoughts in my head. Mm-hmm. And thoughts have a way of attaching to you, especially if they're unhealthy and becoming a part of your life. You'll find yourself saying stuff. That you normally wouldn't say, you'll find yourself doing things that you normally wouldn't do. And it all starts with unrighteous thoughts. Let me read verse 9. It says, if your deeds are good or bad, you will receive multiplied what you wished for your brethren. But it is better to do yourself some harm than to wish it upon one of your fellow men. So... This is what you were saying earlier about if you're having good thoughts, they will be multiplied unto you as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's read one of my favorite scriptures, and that is um, dealing with thoughts. I think it's Philippians 4 and 8. Can you pull that up? Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure... Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. So this is telling us the things that we need to think about. Really? Things that are good, things that are lovely, things that are virtuous. Is that what is that what you get from it? Yeah, so we need to control our thoughts and focus our thoughts on good things. Yeah. Because the opposite will be true, too. If we focus our thoughts on bad things, we've already seen how much damage is actually going to do, not only to us in the living world, but even when we pass on to the spirit world and we have to deal with our conscience for our thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, let's quickly go back to the Shepherd of Hermits real quick. And it says, and we want to finish this out where it says. What verse? Verse 9. Then she, smiling upon me, said, the desire of naughtiness has risen up in your heart. Does it not seem to thee to be an ill thing for a righteous man to have an evil desire rise up in his heart? It is indeed a sin, and that a very great one to such a one. For a righteous man think that which is righteous, and while he does it so, and walketh uprightly, he shall have the Lord in heaven favorable unto him in all his business. But as for those who think wickedly in their heart, 
they take to themselves death and captivity. What do you think about that when it says they take into their heart death and captivity? Well, you know, we understand now the relationship between our conscious and what we know is death or hell. You know, so when we are thinking wickedly, we are actually causing our stay in the spirit world where we'll have to deal with our conscious to be even longer. We'll be in that state of death even longer because it'll take just that long, just that much longer to purify us. Yeah, and I saw also think that it can also apply to us as we're living as well about how unrighteous thoughts can lead us into being captive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How, take for instance, um, the example we gave of uh, lusting after or having evil thoughts about um, or desiring, I'm going to say, uh, for that car. You can go into captivity when you go and purchase that Camara and you know you can't afford it. First of all, you start taking out a loan, which the father does not want us to do. Uh, you can, um, now you got that loan, you got insurance, you got the maintenance on the vehicle. And that leads you in captivity because, for one, now you got to work harder mm-hmm. and different things like that. Mm-hmm. So having these thoughts and learning to master these thoughts by first nipping it in the bud when that temptation comes up on you nip it in the bud and cancel that thought out immediately yeah that's important mm-hmm. like the bible says to resist the devil and he will flee from you that's what it's talking about when you initially have that thought when you have that initial thought to resist that thought and the temptation will go away but if you linger on with it it's going to grow it's going to grow and it's going to cause you to do something. You're actually eventually going to take action. Yeah. You're not going to sit there and keep having that thought and not take action. You're going to do something, even so, if it's wrong. Yeah. So nip it in the bud. So that would be when I asked you earlier, what can we do to master those unrighteous thoughts? And I believe, and I think you would agree, that the answer would be to nip it in the bud. Yeah, to 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 squash it early. Don't let those thoughts stay in your mind to get them out. The second you have a bad thought, and, you know, not only cars and like we're talking about women and stuff, but could actually be talking about drugs and alcohol for the person who's struggling with that. You know, he may have, you know, found himself without for a long time, all of a sudden having a thought about a cigarette or a, a drink or, you know, uh, uh, some type of um, drug or something like that. If he doesn't learn to squash those thoughts immediately when they come, he's, he's going to relapse. He's going to go backwards. So when you think about it, that's the main problem with our addictions is that we don't know to squash those thoughts as soon as they try to creep in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Also, you could think about it like the runner who is on a long distance track. When he first has the idea that he's tired and he wants to quit, if he allows himself to think about that, that's exactly what he's going to do. He's, he's going to stop. Yeah, he's definitely going to quit. But, you know, if he puts it out of his mind, he may be able to go a few miles farther. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, Coach. I think that's all I have to say about um, unrighteous thoughts. I think, you know, I learned something from it. Did you? Yeah. Definitely. I mean, every time you read the scripture, you you, you learn something new. Um, that's the beauty of it. It's like a chisel that, you know, the more you read, the more it actually polishes you and prepares you for this tower-shaped temple that we know as the third temple. And so, we hope that, you know, everyone was able to receive something from the word um, if this class has helped you. We ask that you give it a thumbs up. 
Um, if it did help you, Coach like to say, give it a thumbs down. Hey, they beneficial too. People don't know. <laughs> either way, it just gonna do us some good. You know, thumbs up, thumbs down. As long as you push the button either way and leave a comment. Leave us a comment, and if you enjoy um, this Hermes Academy moment and it helped you, um, we praise the Father for it. Um, and with that being said, uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May He shine His face upon you and be well. gracious unto you and give you peace. Shalom.